Hello and welcome to Finextra TV. I'm Hannah Wallace and joining me today is Steve Everett, Managing Director of Cash Management and Payments at Lloyd's Banking Group and Roy Marsh, Global Payments Director at Finastra. And we're talking about the shifting payments landscape and the power of collaboration going forward. Hello to the both of you. Thanks very much for joining us. Hi. Hi, Hi Hannah. Thank you. Really good to have you on and looking forward to our discussion today, especially as there have been some significant changes happening in payment solutions, uh, which is really where I want to begin. Steve, perhaps you could give us Lloyd's perspective and an overview of the payments landscape today and some of those developments that we're seeing. Okay, so, so there are a number of shifts, as, as you say, the majority regulatory driven. So, you know, as a, as a business that supports customers with their payments, the first thing we need to do every day is be regulatory and legally compliant. And over the last 12 months in particular, the development of ISO 2022 has meant a significant amount of change activity for us, starting with Target 2 back in uh, where we March, and most recently, literally in the last weekend, uh, the changes in the UK around CHAPS RTGS. Mm -hmm. that, that has completely changed the way in which we interact with each other with the use of ISO messages rather than the, the legacy format. So that may, unless you're a payments geek like me uh, and many people listening to this, you'll, you'll find that that's been a, at the bedrock of everything that we've had to do. That evolution also is starting on open banking. You know, what's next for open banking? Again, that is a conversation being driven main, mainly through the payment service regulator. Uh, and, uh, and other interested parties in the UK, and that's going to certainly uh, change how we look forward. And it'd be nice to quite to, to say, you know, what, what's the commercial changes that we've been looking to make, mm -hmm. uh, notwithstanding all of that regulatory change. And that that's been predominantly around the use of open banking and, and API solutions, and particularly how we work with customers outside of their traditional treasury functions and their accounts payable functions, but actually with their product teams about developing. Uh, new, new solutions and I think we'll probably talk about that as the interview goes on. We will indeed. Good to get Lloyd's perspective uh, on those trends and as you say a heavy regulatory start there. So Roy what's your perspective on that? Yeah sure I think <clears throat> you know backing up what Steve says it's been a heavy regulatory environment for the, for the last few years which um, I, I think sometimes seems to have taken the um, a little bit of the eye off of the of, of the business ball because people have been distracted by a, a lot of that that capability going on there. Um, amongst other customers that that we work with, we see during that that time the the rise of the fintech businesses taking some of that payment business away from banks, and the the effect of whether or not that uh, is taking also deposits away as well as just the, the payment services. So mm -hmm. we're keen to kind of see. Um, we, we, whilst we see that, you know, in the world of the remittance world, the person-to-person -per person -person payments, we do wonder if this will bleed into the corporate world. Um, and so the, con the concern maybe that the industry has is what, now that this regulatory piece is coming to a close in the course of the next, say, year, the, how, do we, how does the industry react back to that? How do the major banks like Lloyd's and others react back to, the, uh, to the, uh, these smaller players? That's right. So let's talk more about ISO because there is no doubt there has been a major diversion felt by all banks in recent years. And Steve, could you bring us up to date and tell us what's been achieved so far and what's been the impact there? So I think it depends on whose shoes you sit in. I would say if I'm the end customer, I'm not yet convinced that any of us know what the real commercial benefit is for the end customer that's sending payments. What's got to be good for the industry is that we now have a common format, a common language of which to exchange messages, both domestically and internationally. And that's, you know, as I say, with the Target 2 changes, now the CHAPS changes, and obviously with SWIFT, what we're doing over, over the next few years. But I don't think any of us yet have found that, uh, that commercial agenda. In fact, interestingly, when I talk to a number of the banks at, you know, at Cybos, for example, and we're all in a room, the use cases at the moment are internal within the banks how you improve your data sharing to help reconciliations, et cetera, et cetera. But apart from the biggest customers in the world that are, that are moving money across you know, many different regions, I'm not yet convinced that we know what it is. And the reason for that is there's so much work you need to do on your infrastructure. You know, what, what we've done to be, most of us are using some form of translators to get the money from our customer-facing channels through our core architecture and out 
to the clearing system and back in the other way. And until we make the investment in the channels, how is an SME in the UK really going to be able to think about ISO 2022? Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more to, to, to run with this. And it's interesting when we look at the payment volumes that we see, yes, everything that's going in and out directly from the bank into Target 2 and, and JAPS is going out in ISO format because of the use of translators. When I look at what's coming in on SWIFT, actually only 7% of messages mm. that we get are coming in in the new MX format rather than the MT format. So there is lots to do. That suggests there's an awful lot of banks out there, you know, when they're sending money into the UK, payment instructions into the UK, are not yet fully ready to be able to send outwards uh, in an MX format. So there is, there is lots to come. And at the moment, it does feel like a very heavy compliance project with probably payback for customers, probably I think in the five to 10 year uh, roadmap rather than something that you're gonna see in the next 12 mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. So a lot to come, and as you say, lots to do as well. So, Roy, what do you make of that then? Yeah, I think uh, Steve and I align a little bit on this because we see this as well. We don't really know quite yet where that's going to come from. But I, I think the thinking from the financial standpoint of looking across our customers is um, more and more of us are getting used to the concept of buying things online, doing things um, where you know where you, you know what you're buying, you can flow, you can see, you can track and trace it, you can see an endpoint, you can find out where uh, where the a, a blockage might be, your delivery driver is three stops away, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, those kinds of things have come through Swift GPI and other things in, in, in recent years, but now there's the po the possibility that there's this end-to-end -end play for. Uh, banks like Lloyd's to be able to improve the services, we think. So a kind of use case that I wondered about would be where you've got the reconciliation at the point of the customer. So Steve refers to internal reconciliations, mm -hmm. but the customer's liquidity and the customer's working capital can be affected by whether or not certain payments are made on time or why is a payment being made. And if you get this information within a, within a payment, can you use that to 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 shorten that reconciliation cycle? And can a bank like Lloyd's therefore add working capital services based on that um, based on that service? This is still to be explored, I think, but it's a, an interesting concept that you could move from waiting for the customer to say to you, we'd like some more to borrow some money, please, to, well, now we've looked at your, in, your entire flows and we can see here that you know, over the next three months, you're going to need more working capital, that kind of, a, kind of an idea, could that work? Maybe AI is the thing here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Well, I think what we've covered so far, the trends, the regulatory considerations, it really just hammers home the point that this is a rapidly uh, changing environment. Uh, so off the back of that, I'm interested to talk about uh, collaboration and hear how uh, partner collaboration is enabling a bank like Lloyd's uh, to maintain that competitive edge. Mm -hmm. Steve? Yeah. So we, we look to collaborate with you know, very small fintechs, mature fintechs, or, or tech companies, you know, and, and people like Finastra. And, and we will do that depending on the particular need. So actually, if I think about when we first started working with, with Finastra, that was probably five years ago, I would imagine, where we looked at our core architecture, you know, and like many banks, we had, well, we had a, an international uh, payment platform that was probably as old, as, getting on to be as old as me. Not quite, but you, you know where I'm going with this. Um, and we knew we needed to modernise it. We needed to modernise it back then because we could see things like ISO uh, coming towards us. We also, because of the age of that platform, had very, very low STP rates, straight through processing rates. And actually, if we wanted to scale the business, uh, particularly around international payments, cross-border payments, or borderless payments as they as they're may be now known, uh, we needed to find another provider. And, you know, after the usual processes, we, we uh, landed with, with Finastra. Mm -hmm. And we've been on that journey uh, ever since. And interestingly as well, we put, we put our high value payments through there. So the, 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 the work I alluded to on, on CHAPS, you know, that's all gone through uh, the Finastra platform. But actually, and why, why do we choose a company like Finastra? You know, other, other payment platforms are available. When, you, when you've got to be there 24-7, 365, and you're going to, deal in volume, you have to have somebody that's got a proven track record. And that's where we ended. You're probably not going to find a fintech or want to put your trust, trust in a fintech to do your core payments. What you will want to do then with, with a fintech is actually what's the bolt-on 
propositions we can build mm. that can plug in to Finastra and plug into our other core platforms that enable us to create those compelling propositions for our for our clients. So therefore, you know, the platform has to be API enabled, it has to be open, so that at that ease of integration. And that's that's where we are now, and that's the collaboration. And interestingly, it's not just that FinTechs would come to us, actually we'd look to Finastra to come to us. They see things in other parts of the world. Come and show us what you're seeing in other markets, maybe introduce us to an, other partners. And those partnerships can be very very different for the need. It could be just a straight supplier relationship. It could be we do a JV. It could be a you know kind of some kind of commercial model where we mm. where we, we both invest. So we're very very open to it. But what you do need is you need you need you need the latest technology to which to which to run your business. And I think that's the decision we made several years ago. And we're now starting to see the benefits of that. Hence hence what we did on on, on the chaps RTGS PC in the last couple of weeks and Target two before. It's very positive. Roy, what do you make of that? <laughs> well, it's terrifically positive, isn't it? And I think, um, you know, for us, it's, uh, it's, been a, it's been a great relationship with Lloyd's. It's been more like seven years. I think it just seems that <laughs> it's been, but nonetheless, I was actually at the birthday the 30th birthday party of the previous engine, but that was several <laughs> years back. <laughs> um, but the, the, the idea, Lloyd's stated this very early on. They knew what they wanted to achieve. And that's sometimes, I think, very overlooked is if you can really decide, we know what we want to achieve at the beginning. We, we know the changes we need to make, the, the corporate platform we want to build, and the way in which we then build it out of the, out of, out of the standard, out-of-the-box software, which, was, which we've been able to do here, has been a real mark of collaboration between the two uh, the two companies. So it's been a terrific experience and uh, great teamwork on both sides. It has been a really successful collaboration. So thank you uh, for sharing those insights around the partnership. And now taking all of that into account and coming to the crystal ball question, uh, Steve, what's your perspective on the future trajectory of these payment solutions and what's the impact going to be on the payments market going forward then? Yeah, so the, the change we've talked about today will, will continue. There's no doubt about that. And actually those customers we serve, as I alluded to earlier around, you know, the treasurers and, uh, and the accounts payable for it. The really big change is how do we embrace open banking? And as more and more business, you know, our businesses that we serve goes online, goes onto marketplaces, traditionally they've always um, settled those transactions through cards. Now, open banking gives other opportunities, right, with account to account payments and the costs and the unlocking of working capital, the fact that you can immediately get the funds into your uh, current account. There's huge benefits for businesses to, to go down the account to account route mm -hmm. and maybe, um, you know, further product development on the back of what is the, is the traditional open banking payment. So I think the banks, the fintechs, the different providers need to get closer to the product teams in the underlying businesses that are developing product mm. um, and help them to innovate in terms of their solutions because you know we are, we're all consumers we want a frictionless experience when we check out right <laughs> you know I'll be honest when I'm, I when I when I see an account to account solution and I don't have to get my card out or even if my card's held and my three digit number that's frictionless I like it right I, I would prefer that every day once I've had that experience so there's lots to happen there you know Lloyd's we just recently launched pay me Mm -hmm. um, which is a really simple innovation around, I know, particularly for bigger utility companies that haven't got the bank account and sort code of somebody that's due a refund, and maybe their regulator saying you've got to get, you know, the lights have just gone out in the Highlands of Scotland, and you're a, you're an electricity company serving Scotland. They need to get under regulation that money in the hands of number one First Avenue within X number of days. If they don't have the account number and sort code, they'll send a check. Right? Like we we've created services now that enable those product teams to take that capability and actually improve their business. So that's, that's where I see it going. I think that's where all the fun's going to be, is working with business now, not improving their treasury systems and their treasury processes, but actually how we help them improve their customer propositions. All right, that's exciting. Yeah, very. And Roy, what's your outlook? Yeah, amazingly exciting, isn't it? I, 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 so, you know, for the last few years, we've kind of moved from being, um, we supply you software, you give us, and you, and you pay us for it, to uh, first of all, we got onto the ecosystem idea with the uh, making our systems open, available into the a uh, open API world. We bring our own ecosystem together, we attract fintechs. And the advantage for fintechs with us has always been that they can come, we can deal with the banks the size of Lloyd's because we have the heft to do that. Small fintechs, that's a, that's a larger thing, but we can, 
we can bring and help those fintechs come to that platform. We've been doing that for a few years now, but the but the extension beyond that has become banking as a service. So we're now we we've launched recently um, FX as a service with uh, with a, with a, a other customers. We've got um, possibilities coming out of the banking as a service world, which are, which feeds into this kind of um, uh, capabilities that uh, Steve is trying to get closer to his customers. Right. So mm-hmm. helping Steve get closer to his customers is now our, our mantra uh, on this. And I think, you know, I'll take it as an invitation getting closer to the product teams because it's an area that really excites me personally is what could we do in conjunction with the Lloyd's product teams to help them service the electricity companies the, uh, and others within their, within their corporate world and for that matter their retail world as well, I guess. Yeah. And it's been really interesting uh, for me to hear how partner collaborations have also evolved themselves as mm. well. So mm-hmm. thank you very much for that and thank you very much for your insights. Safe to say watch this space, uh, but we'll leave it there. Thank you. Great. Terrific. Thank you. Thanks very much, Helen.